Come on into the ditch. I'm your resident ditch witch, Tara Tyne, and we're about to get witchy, whether you like it or not. As you can see, I'm uh, working on getting myself settled into Antoine and making myself at home. The first thing that you'll notice is my lovely flower arrangement here behind me and uh, my garlands of miscellaneous purple plastic blossoms which I brought from home. They do a beautiful job of decorating my dresser and I think they're also doing a great job of making it feel a little bit more homely and um, simultaneously ditch-like in here. So let's just do, let's just do a little perambulation of the room, shall we? It's my chamber. Okay, so yes, there is my collection of uh, fakey flowers and some LEDs and a little bit of sparkle because, you know, it has to be done. And I brought the broom in just to remind myself not to get too carried away. And actually, one of the biggest changes I've made was to try and deaden the echo in, a in the room a bit, which is really important. I did a little bit of work on the audio for the last video to make it slightly less echoey and if you watched it you'll notice that it's still pretty echoey so or at least it was then. Myself and Dave have been working over the weekend arts and crafts I'm not even kidding okay we had to uh, bang together some of these uh, sound panels which Dave taught me about let me just show you how those actually work. They're foam panels and there's like four of them on this and you put them facing in alternating ways to just break up the sound waves a little bit when you've got a super echoey room they just kind of catch it and absorb it so that it's not flying about the place willy-nilly you know so I put a few of these panels around the room and they're they're relatively cheap to buy on the internet and I've just stuck them onto some mounting card which I bought in the local arts and crafts supply shop and uh, PVA glue and that's it. Now it's still a little bit echoey because I've got quite a high ceiling all the way up there. And this is kind of my little test run just now on my first day to see how well those are working exactly and uh, just checking out whether or not I have minimized that echo enough that it's not going to sound crap to you and it'll be easy enough for me to tone down using post-production methods. So back to the production methods for now. I just grabbed my uh, my notebook here. I'm already taking notes. Day one I actually thought was mainly just going to be set up. And you can see my little workspace that I have going on here. I got myself a new iPad so that I don't have to carry my laptop in and out to do the editing. and. Most importantly, I've got my copy of Thomas Kinsella's translation of Anton Bokrunje. Before Christmas, I had been living on borrowed copies of that. And then Dave bought me that version for Christmas. So thank you very much, my love. And then I've got my little notepad. So let's have a read. A little brief look through what I found out today. Now today I haven't made it any further than the introduction to Anton Bokulnia in Kinsella's translation. I was busy setting up and to be honest I didn't even think I would make it that far today so gold star for me. So yeah I'm only as far as the introduction and already boom we're straight into what different translators thought specifically about uh, the pillow talk scene but also the larger encompassing themes of Anton Bocogne and it's very interesting how widely these can vary like for example you've got Heinrich Zimmer who believed that the pillow talk scene was a conflict between the Celtic Aryan father dominance and the mother dominance of pre-Celtic inhabitants of the British Isles. Now I quite like that one, that one appeals to me because it's like, 
it's archetypes, you know, that's, that's, that's Carl Jung. Now, whatever's being referred to when we say Celtic Aryan, bear in mind, it was 1969, I believe, when this book was released. So I'm not going to get into what Celtic Aryan means today, nor am I going to try and get to the bottom of what Kinsella means by the pre-Celtic inhabitants of the British Isles. What I am gonna do is take the archety archetypal meaning of both of those, which is basically a patriarchy versus a matriarchy. Two different cultures, two different ways of looking at things, and when they come together, it can be the stuff of epic sagas. And that's what Heinrich Zimmer reckoned was happening in specifically the pillow talk scene of Anton Bokulnik. And then you've got Frank O'Connor, again, very interesting, who believes that the earliest layer of the story as surviving in an incomplete form through the Rusk passages constitutes the remains of an ancient, ironic, anti-feminist poem. Ancient, ironic, anti-feminist poem in Ireland. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Tawn Bokulnia, don't worry, okay, we'll get to why he might have thought that. And, you know, to be honest, at times, the interpretations of it over the years have sometimes felt that way. So put them on the list. We're taking uh, what Frank O'Connor has said with a pinch of salt, kind of like with the rest of these, because honestly, you know, Anton Bocogne is a tale which was written down in medieval times in the form of a series of Remscale and it's basically collections of stories gathered from about the place and um, sort of put together and there aren't that many complete translations of it done by Irish people who aren't just you know taking lumps out of other stories and kind of whacking them in there for the crack like you know or at least to try and get it to make more sense but really the job of a good translator I think is to try and stay as close to the original feeling of the source material as possible so you know not substituting too many uh, words and phrases and not lifting large chunks of storyline that aren't actually included in the original text that, that you're trying to translate. We then also had T.F. O'Rahley who believes that uh, the Ulster stories describe the historical circumstances of the invasion of Ulster by O'Neill's from Leinster as opposed to from Connacht and that Maeve was a tutelary goddess of Tara, the, the hill of Tara and its greater complex. You know, since as a general rule of thumb, we don't have queens in Ireland and even our kings, to be honest, you know, they were king in name and occasionally they would throw their weight around. But to the best of my knowledge, there was never a time in Ireland when a king or a high king was claiming to have total dominion over the people who lived in his jurisdiction and permission to make decisions for them and you know ruin their lives if you wanted to that's not really how you know kings and high kings in ireland actually worked it was really more a symbolic representative thing and on that note then so far i have one other theory by somebody called doris edel who compares Maeve to England's Empress Matilda in the 12th century, which is around the time that a lot of these stories would have been written down. And it's interesting to think, you know, maybe that just some of Ireland's uh, symbols and archetypes and stories were taken and respun in order to kind of make an interesting tale out of what was happening in England at the time, which was mainly due to uh, succession rights after the Empress Matilda had uh, passed away and there was a lot of nonsense going on over that and yeah okay you know we're not above creating commentary on what's happening in England here in Ireland and you know it's it's reasonable to believe that we've always had at least a small bit of interest in what's happening over there 
even if it's just to make sure they're not coming to invade us again anytime soon. But there are a couple of major flaws with Edel's theory on this, which, you know, I mean, the Empress Matilda, as far as I could gather, was put in place because her father had no male heir and was finding it pretty difficult to dig one up. So Matilda got put on the throne and then they weren't really sure what was going to happen after she passed and all of that kind of thing. And if you were to take that and apply it directly to Ireland and the way that Ireland worked under Brehan laws, you're kind of relying on the idea that Maeve's father needed an heir in order to put on the throne and maintain the throne, aka the position of the ruler or monarch of Connacht. And to be honest, Again, that's not really how it works. You know, when Queen Maeve was made queen, it was because she led by strength. She was chosen by her father. Oh yeah, by the way, in case I haven't made that clear, nothing I'm saying in this is to be taken as fact. <laughs> I'm not an academic. I am merely an artist in residency who is looking to uh, understand and put my own personal, humorous and interesting spin on one of Ireland's oldest tales, which also has very, very, very strong roots here in my own area in Louth. Ironically, actually, the pillow talk scene that I'm gonna be covering takes place in Roscommon. More on that later. We're not gonna to worry too much about that for now. Yeah, for now, it's just coming to terms with what does it mean? What does it all mean? I had thought about actually reading through on Tan Bokelnye chapter by chapter with you on some membership videos maybe for those of you who are particularly interested in hearing my reactions to each chapter and then I'm kind of going Tara you're not an academic you're not particularly well practiced at this area so I also don't know about that but if you are watching this and you would like a read along of Anton Bokulnia with just my own interjections, then I'd be happy to make that happen. You just reach out and let me know. And in the meantime, it is almost time for me to pack up and get out of here for the day. So I'm gonna just do a little bit of tidying. I'm going to be back, I think tomorrow as well, just to um, check in on St. Bridget's Day. Tomorrow is the 1st of February in Bulg and yes, I am doing something. I don't always do something for in Bulg, but as it happens, I am going to do something this year. So I'm gonna check back in tomorrow with you and just let you know how I'm getting on with that. And uh, if I don't see it, sure, in Bulg, how in, oh, in Bulg, no, that's not how you say it. In Bulg, hon adiv, goodbye and good luck to you.